Hey, this is Gary Berger. Welcome to Lawyer vs. Lawyer. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Gary. I'm excited to be with you for maybe the, one of the first times in 2022. It's been a while. It We've been, been busy. Too long. I'm feeling a little grumpy. I had a stressful weekend. <laughs> you you have. Yeah, you know, yeah. Everybody's my co-host, Debbie Champion, If you, as you know. Sorry, I should have introduced myself. No, no, you did. Everybody knows. You're the star. So, um, well, I was feeling a little grumpy, and I was like, you know what? Let's get it out. So... Can I tell you, I thought, wait, you know, we talked about it a minute before. I thought we could talk today about things that bother you that the other side does in litigation that is not effective. It's not oh, smart, effective things stuff. Things people get married to and they continue doing the same thing over and over again. Do plaintiff's lawyers like me do that yes. stuff? Yes. Okay. Did and you know defense lawyers do that too? I want to hear it. Well, first, why don't you go I'm first? Scared. No, no, you go first because I'm scared. I'm going to run into things that I do. Here, here, <laughs> here, here's something that bugs me. It, it, it aggravates me. Is the soft admitting fault in opening statement? You have a case. They worked it off. They you worked it up. You're sitting there going, "Why am I trying this case?" And the, and they get up and you have a whole deal. You're proving causation. You have all your pictures. You're ready to play your depots on fault and you got a google image of the scene and you got blah 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 you're ready to tee up the other side knows it and you do a whole opening statement where you the plaintiff spent i spent half the time talking about fault and they get up and say hey you know we're really not arguing about that there was a rear end or what the light was and da 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 and i that, that bugs me so tell me is it effective though for the defense no no is, do you do that? Rarely, but I have done it. Okay. And usually the reason that I do that... Is to get favor with the jury so you have some credibility. No, like no. Like you're responsible. It's, it's bigger than that. If I Generally, if I'm going to admit fault, and I rarely admit fault, but generally if I'm going, <laughs> if I'm going to admit fault, the, per, the plaintiff's attorney knows that I'm probably going to because it's a rear ender or it's something where... There really is no comparative fault issue. I will sometimes admit some fault, like the fault of my person, but I argue that it's not completely my fault, and that's why we're here, is to talk about uh, comparative fault. But sometimes you've got clients who won't admit fault. Yeah. And that may be the insurance company or it may be the insured, and this is the first time you've had the opportunity to admit it. Because now you're in trial, you can say whatever you want to. <laughs> and sometimes that does happen where you know the best the best strategy is admitting fault. But your clients have wanted to fight it from the very beginning, and now you're stuck with going to trial, and now you got to get up and admit it. Yeah, the ones, that I, the ones that irk me are, are the more illegitimate ones, where they haven't given me a... I get it. If the other side says, listen, I'm going to admit fault right. in the opening, so right. don't worry about it, and right. I'm gonna, then I'll deal with it. Or... or uh, 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 but here, what ha I think it's when people aren't really paying attention to their files and they come up and that they're going to do it and they're making some yeah. decision the night before. I'm going to take the wind out of their sails because yeah. I want to talk about blah, 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 not why we're really here. And, um, and I think it's to gain a false sense of responsibility for the jury so they can stand up and say, kind of, why are we here? We admitted fault and now this is just some greedy plaintiff wants a bunch of money. And I'm yeah. like, are you kidding me? You never admitted fault ever and and you offered me squat in this case and now you're you're it's smart i get the tactic i don't think it's effective because of what i do in response what do you do i tell the jury in this closing that that they didn't admit fault in their answer and they never answered it we took the deposition on this date they never did it we did they, they could they have a duty to amend their answer supplement their discovery never one whisper until this, until after I can't talk to you anymore because they're trying to gain false favor with you and try to impress you that all of a sudden they're responsible when they haven't been responsible for three and a half years of litigation since we came to here. And it's a bogus attempt to sway you and you can't do it and ignore that and give us a big verdict. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, that's the message that I try to say. I, t I take, I show the jury that they're getting scammed. Yeah. And I, and I think juries really don't like that. Do you ever, this is just a suggestion, suggest an opening? I put the answer in evidence. I can't. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying, suggest an opening. Well, you know, 
I, you never know what they're going to say, but we have the opportunity to discovery, da, 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 and every time they've denied this, and so let me tell you what I think the evidence is going to show. It's a good idea. I, I usually don't. I usually just... Uh, Combat it when it comes I up. just tell the facts, and then I let it happen, and I let the jury get... Uh, if they're going to do it, let them get sucked in a little bit, and I say, where's the amended answer? Where's the thing? Although, interestingly... Do you know it's harder to get an abandoned pleading into evidence and read to a jury than a oh what? Than, yeah. than a current yes, pleading? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that really, I, sometimes then I try to read the answer and they say you can't read an answer, and I'm like, and it and isn't that weird that you I can, can't? You can read the facts asserted in the answer, right? Isn't yeah. That well, no, way? I've done it, but there is there, there is that defense thrown up against yeah. me uh, when I try yeah. to say, hey, they filed an answer denying liability for two years. Yeah. They could have amended that. That's the official court document, and I get. They try to let me not do it, so there. But there's some interesting law on that. I think the facts. I think the pleadings that issued. I think the rule is you can only read facts, but right. the way you That's plead, true. you plead facts. Yeah, and exactly. they deny those facts. Right, and I think those facts can come in. Yeah, what, what do you? Say you're liable, and they right deny conclusions that. of law yeah, yeah, or yeah. your negligence yeah. or damages. Yeah, is there anything? What do plaintiffs do that that irk you? Are, are you wait? Hold on. Are you are you grumpy today? Or are you happy today? I'm happy today. Good, good. Uh, because it's the first day in after a long break, so I'm happy. But I have a list anyway of things. Congratulations that I'm from your about. break. Thank you. What are you now? Like Thank the grand poobah of trial lawyers? <laughs> Did you get that award? <laughs> It was called Biggest Dingbat of Trial Lawyers. What'd you get? But I'll what tell were you. What you honored to receive? So I was inducted into the American College of Trial Lawyers. Congratulations! Was really exciting. It was it was really fun. Uh, the weather in San Diego was cold. <laughs> Seventy two degrees <laughs> always, right? That's what I thought. No, oh. it was all in the fifties. So, but we had we had a good time. So I'm glad to be back. But this has been. Uh, but I've been thinking about. Tell me what. Go. Ahead. I interrupt some you. Of what? These that yeah. You're tell me. About. Tell me. Yeah. So so for you know since the reptile theory came in, I've noticed a lot of attorneys who do personal injury law have changed their t- tactics to be consistent with whatever theory it is, whoever they follow. If they're following Keith Mitnick or Jerry Spence or the reptile theory, who whatever they're following. They do whatever the new thing is to do, even if that, quote, new thing is really ineffective. You know, you see this. One, I'll just give you one example. Like what? What happens when you're selecting a jury? I'll just give you that one. Where you're asking the entire jury panel certain questions that have nothing to do with the case, but help you identify what you think might be pre-existing prejudices like, for example, what TV shows do you watch? What books do you read? That sort of thing. That's one of them. Sometimes it's even weirder stuff. You know, sometimes it's stuff that makes no sense. That um, I don't want to give. I don't want to give too specific of examples because people will hear this and know I'm talking about them. But there are some questions people ask, like, "Would you rather do A or B? Are you?" Do you like people who are Jewish better than people who are Catholic? Do you like, I mean, and then they <laughs> raise their hand. These seemingly non related questions, and it goes on and on and on. And the jury by that time is looking around like, what in the world are we doing here? It drives them crazy. Why is that not effective? It might be effective to the attorney in trying to determine whatever he or she is trying to determine. But it certainly is not effective in getting the jury on your side in the case they're about to hear. It does not uh, educate the jury on anything you're trying to educate them on. It doesn't build a relationship with a trust with the jury. It doesn't. You're not listening to the jury, and you're not learning really anything about that person except that particular answer. All right, I'm going to ask you. Think of another one. Okay. I want, to, I want you to go twice in a row. Okay. So one time I was picking a jury. It's one in which I set, a, I think, a record on striking for cause. But I had a guy in the back row who I was talking. Now, I don't do that. But I had a guy in the back row who I was standing up. I was going back and forth with him on something. And, and at the end, before he's about to sit down, I thought I was done. And, and I asked the one question too many. I said, hey, where do you get your news? 
because I knew where it was. Yeah, of course. And he looked at me without missing a beat, and he said, why, are you trying to find out if I'm conservative? And I said, I'm going to move on. That's hilarious. <laughs> he called me out in a second, and I was, because I usually don't do that because I don't like it, because that yeah. is what it is, and it's not that disguised. It's, it's not a disguised, little too, but do a jury yeah. questionnaire if you want to know those things. Yeah, you know. You know, you ask them, and I don't know who's asking. I think the court's asking. So yeah. if you really want to know those kind of That's questions, a good idea. do a jury questionnaire. But you're defeating your relationship with the jurors by making them mad by asking them questions. And like if that. you're having a little lack of candor, you're kind of playing a little game. Yeah. And and you're with yeah. their time. Yeah. Especially in COVID times now. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I don't know what people want to sit around their neighbor who might have Omicron, the guy next right. to him, Omicron and talk about what shows they want. They like dogs better than cats. Right. What's <laughs> what's uh, what uh um uh we we finally got a cat where dog people we have the coolest cat now. I'm a dog. I'm definitely a dog person. And me too. I've I, my <laughs> wife and I have fostered 200 cats in the last oh. two, two, 200 dogs. In the last four years, we foster a lot of dogs. But we got this cat that is the coolest cat. She like roams around. She brings us birds. She hangs. She 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 walks around with us. She follows us. She's great. Anyway, that's she cute. loves my three and a half year old son. She sleeps with him every night. Oh, it's so that's cute. Great. He loves her. I Give me another one. What else do lawyers do? All right. So uh, I'll just we'll just start from the very beginning, which is this new thing where people do not bring their clients into the courtroom. I don't understand it. Okay. I do not understand it. We have all heard absence makes the heart grow fonder. That is bull. It does not. Okay. It does not make the heart grow fonder. And so I think this all started when people had clients who were really, really, really injured. And so they decided not to bring them into the courtroom because of the idea that being around somebody desensitizes you to their injuries. You know what I mean? And it so can a little bit, right? It can. It can. And I remember years ago, I had this case, and it was a quadruple death case. It was a horrible case. That case, we could do a podcast just on that case. It was a terrible case. We started a trial in the city, and, and Kevin Schnurbush, you know, who was my partner until his death a few years ago, was had decided to come up there with me and help me try this case because it was just too big for one person. And yeah. I'll never forget that we were picking the jury and the jurors started crying about some of the deaths because it was ch- some children died, some adults died. So I see the jurors crying. And <clears throat> the, <laughs> Kevin wrote me a note and said, the jurors are crying. Well, of course, we're here in front of the jury. And I, and I wanted to lean over and write him a long note and say, that's okay. They're going to be here for weeks. The jurors are going to get desensitized to this. It's good to get them crying early because then they'll get over it. But instead, I couldn't write all that. And I wrote to him and said, that's okay. They'll stop. And he always said later, you are the most evil woman I have ever seen. And I'm like, I just couldn't write it all down. But the point is, that's exactly what happens. If you have somebody who's missing an arm or a leg and they are in there all week, people get to know them and they forget about their limitations. And so I do think it works in those situations. But if you've got somebody in there, their injury is, is not visible. Not visible. Not visible. Then in my opinion, and again, I always talk about things from a psychological perspective, but in my opinion, it is better for your clients to have a relationship with that jury than for your clients to be sequestered from that jury. I think it backfires every time. Every time. <laughs> Yeah. Unless it's a bad, bad, obvious injury. Yeah, I think, um, you know, most, uh, many trials are short, you know, too. So I think, I, you know, I hear you, a, a three or four day jury trial, at a car wreck, even with bad injuries and stuff, you want the jury, unless it's visible, you know, seeing that, there, there's those, there's the... You know, if, if the jury's there working, the, cl- the plaintiff ought to be there working, too. They're there every day. That's hard. Juries go, why are these people not here? Yeah. I'm doing all this work yeah. for them, and I got called in. I'm making 12 bucks an hour a day to, to go do this, and you can't even respect right. me That's by right. being here and sitting through the, yes, is it boring? So you send the wrong message. And even if you say, do they give a long speech? Like, let me tell you why my client isn't here. Or they can't. I mean, you're right. Now, if it's a wheelchair or if it's something really bad or something, that may be different. But then I've tried catastrophic injury cases. And there are times when I haven't moved them out of the courtroom, but I've moved them back in the galley yeah. so that if I'm doing other stuff, they don't need to be at the council table in a wheelchair, you know, um, 
But yeah, I think it's probably overdone, right? I think it is, and I think people do it without thinking about what it really means. That's right. what kills me. You got to make, you got to think about what the effect of your actions are. Right. Is. Right. How right. about you? What else do you have? Well, something that is not a, that that people d- that make a mistake and they don't do it well is when they're trying to badly and incorrectly impeach my witnesses and my and my clients. So I put my plaintiff on, or I put a. A, a family member on or in a dep, you know, we're playing a depot, and they people, lawyers think, I guess, that because in another part of a depot a year ago, the plaintiff said something they may think is a little bit different, that they can just get up and just say, Well, you said this in your depot, and that's not true, and now you're lying now, and make a speech about it. And it bugs me. From a, from a practitioner's guide, because that's not how you cross-examine someone with a prior inconsistent statement, and it looks sloppy, and then I'm getting up and objecting. Uh, sometimes the judge also doesn't know the way a little bit, too, yeah. so it can be a little... that I don't want to look like I'm trying to hide anything yeah. or anything like that, uh, but I don't think it's effective, uh, also. I think a... Impeachment with a prior inconsistent statement can be one of the most effective things to do if done right. If you don't do it right, you muddy the waters and the jury's like, what are you talking about? I mean, there's something to be said about having the depo, page 42, line this, yeah. and yeah. then there's a no instead of a yes, and it's really effective, <laughs> yeah. and you show it up on the screen and stuff. So um, I think it's ineffective. I think it's sloppy, and I think that... Uh, it's, I don't know if lawyers are doing it because they don't know how. Or... I, I think that's it. I don't think people know how. I remember when I first got out, I had a trial, and I think it was George, Judge Corrigan. I think Judge Corrigan was Judge the senior Judge Corrigan. Right. Who is well, no we longer. have to say that now, right? That's right. I, and I think it was after one of his cases, he looked at me, and and the jury came back, and he looked at me and said, Hey, Debbie. And I said, Debbie, he said, if you ever want to learn to really impeach somebody, you can come see me, and I'll help you because you don't do it for shit. <laughs> and I didn't. And I, well, I followed him back to the. I followed him. I'm like, tell me, teach me. What do I need to do? And he he did. And it's it's an art form. You need to understand, and you need to know when to do it and why to do it. And if you aren't showing the jury this person's a liar, then you just look like a jerk. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good way to say it. Because also, uh, people will sit there because the other thing is when they do it sloppy and do it, they have something in their mind what the person said in their depot. Yeah. But a lot of times, it's different than what's actually yeah, on paper. That's exactly. And right. you're like, show me where this. Yeah, is. that's right. And when the person ends up not specifically impeaching them. Then, and there's an explanation for why the two answers are different, then you look like a complete jerk. Either side. That's good for either side. It is true. And then, yeah, I learned to do it from, my, from my, one of the first trial lawyers. And, 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 then, and when you're deciding on whether to impeach and whether to make the big to-do about it, you, you've got to look at how, how, am I right on this one? Do I got them or not got Because right. I have a lot of times where I'm sitting there, do I impeach it? And they're on direct, and I'm about to cross, and I'm... I'm Flipping through the depot to find exact. Oh, you know what? I thought. It, you know what? I don't yeah. think I got him on this that's one. Let's exactly move to right. the next one. That's exactly. There's a lot right. of in trial decisions about that. So that's something that bugs me that defense lawyers do, um, and and that I don't think is effective. <clears throat> what else you got? Uh, oh, you're gonna make me good. Yeah, you oh, do. Okay, two, okay, two. okay, I'll do two. Or then you got to do at least two. Um, <laughs> so here, here. All right. Well, all right. Here, I. Yeah. Tell me if you tell me if I'm wrong on this one. I don't like it when a defense lawyer does not have a cohesive defense, but just throws a lot of stuff against the wall to see what sticks. Because they will sit there and say, "Well, we kind of weren't really at fault, and there was a kind of this." And I'm not going to say. There was degenerative back condition because there was never treatment. But look at the old MRI and look at the disc spaces narrowed. And I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, say this. And then I think your wage loss damages. So it's kind of a uh, hodgepodge or aren't all plaintiff's lawyers, you are throwing in weird plaintiff's lawyers are greedy yeah, yeah. and the system and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I find that to be... Um, I don't know, though, if I'm just being persnickety because 
as a plaintiff, I feel that I have to have a clear, cohesive theory of the case. And I think it's kind of lazy just to throw all that. You already said the word shit, so I'll say throw that <laughs> shit against the wall and see what and see what sticks. I was quoting Judge Cole. <laughs> well, you could be quoting me as well. Or so am I being persnickety and does that work? Or because I have seen uh, good, I've seen good defense lawyers, and I'm uh, that when they sit there and have a cohesive theory of the case, after they get done in, in opening and in close, you're like, oh, oh. I'm in tr- oh, I need to do something different. That's really smart. They thought about this and that. So that's what that that's what I got. I see exactly what you're saying, and it you are right. You know, I mean, that's one of the things that's hard to be a plaintiff's attorney on because you oh. have you all have to think about it logically. You have to present it to the jury logically. They have to understand step one through step ten, and there are attorneys who are just shooting. I'm gonna shoot randomly at everything they've got. Maybe I'll poke a few holes, and the jury will. You know, or sometimes I say this a lot to myself. I'll say, if I can get one person to believe this, then they might help me bring the verdict down. So that's what they're doing. I mean, they're, but, but, so how do you fight that? Do you just point out they don't have a defense? You know, they've told you this, they've told you this, they've told, but they're not talking about the facts in this case. Well, let me, the, the, the reason why, uh, some, it can be intentional, but the reason why sometimes I think pe- defense lawyers do it is they're, they don't have the so so back to what my first point about admitting fault. The yeah. best admitting fault I see is when someone files an amended answer yeah. and admits fault and admit they did it. Yeah. And that's really effective. And it really takes the wind out of my sails because all I'm talking about is damages. Same thing back to this point here is the defense is not really ready to commit. Some people may think it's liability. Yeah. Some people may think it's a general package. Some may people <clears throat> may think the wage loss claim is BS or something. So um, I think it's just uh, I maybe them are afraid to commit to one thing and yeah. really, really fight yeah. that. You yes. know how, but you know how I fight it is I fight it. One is I say I, I've said many times in closing argument they're just put throwing everything against the wall to see what stick. Right, and you got to not let them do that because that's not their burden. They got to sustain the burden of proof right. too. And and then the other thing I do is I try to point out that that's a good argument, by the way. Thanks. Because, sorry, yeah, sorry, I'm talking too no, much. No, you're Go not ahead. talking too much at all, but I think that's a really important point that a lot of plaintiff's attorneys don't hold the defense to. You know, we always talk about the burden of proof. I always hold up the burden of proof instructions. I always throw it on an overhead or show it te- technologically because the burden of proof issue is so important in the jurors' minds. And, def- and plaintiff's attorneys don't often hold the defense at least not properly. They don't hold it properly. They don't hold our feet to the fire properly on the burden of proof issue. But you're exactly right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt that, but I just wanted to highlight how important that is. No, and which that's dovetailing to the second thing I was going to say is I do try to hold their feet to it. There's a great book called, on the plaintiff's side, for anybody listening, called Polarizing the Case. I think it's by the guys who did the Rules of the Road. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the idea in, in that is that you, you hold the defense accountable to the argument they're making. So if they're saying that the problem is really from a degenerative back condition, what they're really saying is my client's lying. You're, you're saying that my clients, when they said they're, all their back problems are from this, you're saying that they're lying to them right now. And, and too many times, I think plaintiff's lawyer you got to hold them to it and so you you i get up and i say well what are you saying are you saying that my client's lying about whether the light was red or green or are you lying about whether my client says i didn't have back problem before and now i do or are you asking her to lie and say whether or not she lost these wages or whether she can do this stuff i just looked up the book you're talking about it's polarizing the case um and it's a trial guide Exposing and defeating the malingering myth. That's that's probably what you're talking Who, did about. Did Friedman or Malone write uh, it? I can't. I think it's Friedman. Yeah, Friedman. Yeah. Rick he, Friedman. Rick Fri- he wrote uh, Rules of the Road. Great, okay, great guy. That's who that is, yeah. yeah. So they're talking about people like defendants who are saying, well, this is, they're not, there's yeah, nothing really Are you really saying you're malingering? Wrong. Are you right. saying that you're lying right. about how badly you're injured and you won't go back to work? Because if that's what you're doing, let's call it a lie. Because right, you're right. what you're you're doing it subtly and by innuendo, 
But you know what? If you're calling my client a liar, you got to call him. Be a be straightforward, straightforward about it. Be straightforward about it um, and say it and it what it is. And then I can defend it. I can't defend right. shadows. I can defend a position. Well, that's a good way to put it too. Yeah, and I like that. Yeah. So that's so I don't like it. And I, I know I'm moving around on a couple of different issues, but that's how I defeat it. Is I I, I nail the polarizing. The, the I try to call it like it is. What you're really saying, defense lawyer, is da 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 da. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that. All right, you got to have two now. Give me two things that plaintiff's okay, lawyers so do. This is not all plaintiff's lawyers, and it's not just plaintiff's lawyers. But I've seen this so often, and I know I'm going to sound old. And I'm not saying this because I'm old. I already sound like when I say, <laughs> oh, kids these days don't know how to impeach a witness. Kids these days. I did too. No one taught them. I already sounded old. <laughs> all right, here's the deal. Technology. I get it. I think technology is wonderful. It's great. It has its place in the courtroom. But I cannot tell you how many times I've tried a case where people have focused on the technology over the substance of what they're doing. It drives me crazy. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you a couple examples. One is one time we went to lunch and the attorney had somebody up there in his office, from his office, presenting whatever they were presenting. I'm probably pulling up the uh, uh, exhibits, probably, maybe even playing excerpts. I don't remember exactly what they'd been doing, but it was a really important role for him. And he had no file, no hard copies of his file. And so what happened? So I go, go to lunch, I come back, my client, the insured is there with me. He's a cute little guy, he leans over and he said, Debbie, I need to talk to you about something. And I said, what? He said. I don't know what to do about this. And I said, what? And he said, when you all were at lunch, the person that works with the plaintiff's attorney came in and picked up that laptop and dropped it to the floor and hooked it back up. And I don't, I bet it's not going to work. I mean, she really dropped that, that computer. And I said, well, there's nothing, it's not our deal. There's nothing I can do about it. And he'll be here in a minute. He'll turn it on and see what's happening. Well, sure enough, he comes in. First thing he does is he turns it on. And the co-worker was there and had said, yeah, I don't know. What's wrong with it? <laughs> and, my, and the guy's like, I know. I know what happened. I'm like, you cannot tell on her. Just, you know, what, what are you, what's telling on so her? So the assistant do? was not telling her Didn't boss. Didn't tell it. <laughs> Didn't tell it. And the guy is there with no file. All of his stuff on his computer. Oh, that's, that's so one example. Funny. And it was a mess. I mean, I mean, funny in a bad way. <laughs> he, he ended up doing fine, luckily. But I mean, I, I'm like, whatever exhibit you have, here's my exhibit. Just dig around in there and get what you want. And you'll we'll talk about how I do my exhibit. So I had copies of everything he had. But I'm telling you, he he was in trouble. And so you, it's important. That it's really good. But most of these cases. We don't have to put on a dog and pony show. We just, the jury just wants to know what the evidence is. And in my opinion, you cannot go in there without a backup. You cannot do it. And it happens so many times. Another time I will tell you is um, <laughs> this, this, I tell this story because it gets me so tickled. We, it's always lunch, isn't it? Something always happens over lunch. We come back from lunch. The attorney has his entire office set. Hey, let me interrupt you. Yeah. So, you know, uh, 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 I played a video. I, one of the cases I tried like three years ago, four, five, four or five years ago. I don't know, three years ago. Anyway, I was playing a video. It didn't work. Oh, and I was doing it myself. It's and so we got out without missing a beat. We got up. I put my paralegal on the stand. She asked me questions. And we just did it reading back and forth because we had it highlighted and yeah, ready to sorry. go and add our backup. But the irony is, do you know who does my video now? Who? In that trial, the opposition had a great AV guy that then I hired after to do all my depot cutting because he was really helpful. He figured it out and helped us play the rest oh, of the video. So we worked together. So unlike your client telling them, I worked with the opposition and That's we shared it. Maybe. But anyway, go ahead for your next story. The next one is we're doing closing. We go to lunch, come back from closing, have everything ready, and... The attorney, I shouldn't tell this, but it was just so funny. The attorney has his whole office set up in there. He's got a printer. He has everything, everything you'd want. Computers, not, <laughs> not, 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 I'm talking desktop, not laptop. Has computers, this is free iPhone. Wires iPad. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, wires everywhere. 
And the judge comes out. He says, are you all ready? I say, yes, judge, I'm ready. The other attorney says, yes, judge, I'm ready. I just need to print off my, oh, my closing. So the judge calls the jury in. And all of a sudden you hear. (laughs) (laughs) You hear. It was a dot matrix printer. Oh, my God. And it was a, I don't remember, I want to say 12-page closing. And it took like 20 minutes. So we're sitting there, and I got tickled about it. So I'm about to die laughing. So, And I don't know why. I mean, I, I, I liked this attorney. He had done a really great job. It just it just hearing that, 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 that with, as every t- everything was typed out, I got so tickled. And finally, the judge is like, what is going on? And he said, uh, Judge, I've got my, my, my opening or my closing is printing. And I, I just have a few more pages. He says, how many pages do you have? And he said, I have um, three here. And the judge said, uh, go ahead, Mr. So-and-so, and start your closing. And, and Debbie, as you see print pages print out, hand them to him. So I had to stand there and hand him. And you know he hated that. But oh my, my point is, you cannot rely on, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. But you cannot just rely on technology. You have to have a backup. I could tell more stories, but you have to focus on the substance rather than how you're going to get it up. And what you said is exactly right. In my opinion, you've got to have some third party there in charge of it. Uh, there, yeah. I, you know, you always have that and you have it highlighted. And I think that juries like different mediums. It's you Have some stuff on a screen, but have paper copies of medical records highlighted and then have a board with a picture of something and a lot of times I use my I have a big styrofoam board it'll have my it'll have the verdict director it'll have a picture of the surgery or picture of the car crash and I flip it around and I just write down numbers in closing yeah and I do different stuff and I think juries like to see different mediums yeah different uh, textures yeah thank you better good and when they take it back to the jury room they need hard evidence. They want to see this stuff. So one of uh, uh, one of the great speech giver, uh, Bill Clinton, and one of his um, uh, State of the Union addresses, you see him turn around and whispers to Al Gore. Al Gore leaves and then comes back, and he gets up, and Bill Clinton gives a great hour and 15-minute speech. And you learn later that the teleprompter didn't work he went to Al Gore and said, someone put it up, and he gave his State of the Union for, for the first 30 minutes from memory. Oh without missing gosh. a beat, you couldn't tell. And then they finally got it on and, oh and moved gosh. it. Oh my gosh. But, but you gotta have backup. You gotta know the speeches. You gotta know your opening. Yeah. You gotta know your exhibits. You gotta yeah. know some of those. Yeah, yeah, you do. And we get scared to rely on what we know. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Uh, what else? Any other plaintiff stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can keep coming up with stuff, but, I, but I'll just, this is a quickie that you'll... Give me a quickie, and then I got one other quickie, okay, and then we'll perfect. wrap this one up. Perfect. Uh, medical bills. Medical bills and evidence. I, sometimes it's really smart not to put the medical bills and evidence. Sometimes it's really stupid. My whole point is to think about your case and make a decision based upon your case. Sometimes you have a lot of medical bills, and sometimes, particularly if you're in a conservative place... You're go- you may need those medical bills because the jury may think they're doing you a great favor by giving you $30,000 when you might have had medical bills 75 or 50 and you might have gotten 30 plus 75 or 50 and people just show up and think, okay, I'm not going to put my medical in because it doesn't illustrate all the problems my client has. And that drives me crazy because I feel like you're doing what somebody else is telling you to do when you don't understand the psychology behind it. And so that annoys me sometimes that does too that annoy i i get it and i i know the lawyers talk about it and the idea behind that to do it is you don't want to anchor the jury to a yeah. low number yeah. if you're going to ask for a high number i get it but that doesn't fit every shoe right. you know and so if you don't have a case Completely. with a lot of if your case isn't a million dollar you know, a huge verdict number in the first place, don't worry about anchoring to another number. And sometimes if it's kind of a medium case, you can sit there, explain to the jury, 
when you're sitting around, when something happens to you and you're in the hospital visit, tell me if you've heard this already. And when you're visiting your, your relative who's in the hospital who's ill, do you sit and talk about medical bills? <laughs> That's no. right. You Ooh, sit and like talk that. about how hurt you are and how this affects you. And are you going to be able to pick up the grandkids? You don't worry about that stuff. And so, so there's ways to handle bills in trial. Um, uh, and, uh, and then not every case is a case where the medical bills are really low, but the person has a significant disability permanent that can't be cured by medicine and it's a million dollar case and the bills are five grand. In that case, I'd leave out the medical, but not, not every case is like that. It's just the independent thinking that we need to see. Tell me your last thing. Well, you know, and yeah, I see a lot of people using stuff because they think it's going to work. And I'm like, you have a, you kind of had a bad case to begin with. You can't sprinkle magic right. juice on it. Right. You can't sprinkle. Right. And then all of a sudden it's a million dollar case that everybody wants to be in the Lord's Weekly. The last thing I'll close with, we've been going for a little while. Um, I, um, when you said medical bills, I was going to thought you were going to say plaintiffs lawyers who aren't ready to put them in and haven't done the evidentiary foundation and turn around to you oh. when they're putting them in and saying, are you stipulating this? And you're going, no. <laughs> but anyway, I always get that ready. There's a lot of that. Um, uh, I don't like it when defense lawyers don't give me their exhibits before trial or before they're using them. And they play a, oh, I didn't give you that. Here's the medical from the primary from five years before, blah, blah, blah. I'm not giving it to you. And... So it's trial by ambush, and I think, and that bugs me. It's not what you're supposed to do. You can, what are you going to do? Get a continuance? I mean, you don't want a continuance. That me crazy. And I, th- I think both sides probably do it. But I, when I, most of the time, when I try a case, I hand the other side. Here's a binder with everything I'm using for the next three or four days. They get it, and most other lawyers give me their stuff too. And that everybody has an equal playing field. There's no surprise stuff. Now, if there, do I have work? If I have work product stuff, or if I have stuff I don't want them to see, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm gonna, I don't mind surprising people. I know your trick on looking up social media the night before you cross-examine the plaintiff. Should I tell people that? <laughs> but then you, there's nothing to produce, right? So um, anyway, that's, that's one right. of my pet peeves. I am with you. I think what you just said makes total sense. The frustrating part is is a lot of times the other side, whichever side it is, thinks they have a big surprise that they're going to shock you with. There are no big surprises that really make that big of a difference. Not if you've done your discovery. And so there's no reason. I don't even get it. I tried a case recently where I never saw a single, never got a single copy of an exhibit, never saw a single exhibit, and did, they didn't have an exhibit list they kept up with. So during trial, I'm like, what was exhibit seven? What was it? It drove me crazy. That drives me crazy. I'll tell you what I do, though. And that hurts your record. What's offered and admitted. I oh, have an offered exactly and admitted sheet. We right. keep it. We probably need to talk again sometime soon about uh, making a record. But you're exactly right. So I always give my exhibit list to the judge, to the reporter, and to the other side. As me soon as too. Get there. Now, I don't give my exhibits, and let me tell you why. I have a little bit of weirdness in that I mark A little everything. bit of weirdness? <laughs> well, oh, just for this. It, it, I mark everything in the case. I mark everything. So you don't want all my exhibits. It's a big waste of time. So I have you look at them. If there's anything you haven't seen or you wonder what it is, go look at it. I've got copies for you. I just don't give them out because it's too much crap that you don't want. Uh-huh. But you're welcome to it. I just show up with it all. Here's my exhibit list. Here they are in order. Get whatever you want out of there. But you don't really want every medical record you've already seen a million times. That's true. That's true. So that's what I do. All right. You've been listening to Lawyer versus Lawyer. Thanks for another great episode, Debbie. It's great to see you, Gary. You too. Thank you.